Today we're going to talk about skewness, or as I like to call it, lopsided variability. Some distributions are symmetrical, that is, they have no skewness. Skewness is how much a distribution deviates from symmetricality. One of the most famous distributions without any skew, of course, is the normal distribution. In fact, the normal distribution is the distribution with which we compare all others. For example, this blue distribution is positively skewed. And the fact that it has a 1.14 skewness is beside the point. What the point is, is that the tail on the right has a lot more stuff than the tail on the left compared to the normal distribution. And it's lopsided. The long tail goes in the positive direction, and hence we say it has positive skewness. This distribution is the mirror image, and it has negative skewness. It happens to be negative 1.14, but the point is that it has a long tail on the left and a short tail on the right, and therefore it's negatively skewed. Where does skewness come from? Well, unfortunately, there's not one answer, but a lot of answers. That is, skewness can arise from a variety of different kinds of processes. Let's examine one of them. This is a normal mixture distribution. It looks like a skewed distribution. It arises from the fact that we have three separate normal distributions, each of which has a different mean and a different standard deviation, like so. These three normal distributions have different means, and what the particular means are doesn't really matter, and what the particular variances are doesn't matter either. But when you add these things on top of each other, you get this. Now what do I mean by add them together? What I mean is literally take the probability density functions and stack them on top of each other. So this is starting with the blue distribution, stack the red one on top of it, stack the purple one on top, and you get the whole distribution. We could have started with purple and stack red on top of it and then blue on top of it. Either way, we get the same result, it's just a different stacking order. So a normal mixture distribution is when we take normal distributions and add them on top of each other. It turns out that with normal mixture distributions, we can produce a very, very wide variety of distributions, not all of which are skewed. Here's a really, really skewed distribution, and it consists of a whole bunch of little normal distributions, and as the mean goes up, so does the variability. We'll see later how this distribution will help us understand skewness in more detail, but let's look at some others. Here is a non-skewed distribution. It consists of two normal distributions, one of which has very little variability, and one of which, which has quite a lot, like so. Here we have two normal distributions widely separated, and you get a bimodal distribution. This is another bimodal distribution. A mode, of course, is a, is a peak or a, a lump in there, and one of them is bigger than the other. So technically, this is the, the, the mode, but sometimes we call it the major mode. And this other one, this other lump, the peak of it, we would call the minor mode. What you can see is that there are really two normal distributions underneath, and it produces this uneven lump structure. Here's a trimodal distribution, not skewed. You can see, of course, that it has three normal distributions underneath. Here we have, wow, lots of normal distributions. Five at least, but if we look underneath, it's really six. We've got five narrow ones and one in the middle down here that uh, makes it have this bumpy structure here. Here's a really exotic distribution. It has that bimodal structure and then those little teeny narrow structures in there. Here's an asymmetric one. So as you can see, the number of shapes of distributions that we can create with normal mixture distributions is very, very wide. We can't produce all of them, but we can produce some pretty funky looking ones, most of which we'll never see in psychology. Here's one that we will. It's not quite so exotic, but it approximates the distribution of intelligence. Intelligence is mostly normally distributed, but it turns out that we have too many cases on the bottom end, too many cases of mental retardation. We also have a little bit too many up at the very top, but I haven't modeled that here. So here what we have are two separate populations, one of which we can say is chromosomally normal, and then we have a subpopulation with chromosomal abnormalities, which causes a lot of cases of, of severe mental retardation. So it's infrequent, but when it happens, it produces a dramatic reduction of intelligence. Probably the most famous of these chromosomal abnormalities would be Down syndrome. Now, there's more than one chromosomal abnormality, so we should probably have lots of small distributions down here, and it would add up to what we observe as the distribution of intelligence. So the normal mixture distribution is one way that we produce skewness, but there are many, many others. This is the log normal distribution. The reason that it's called the log normal distribution is that if you took the log of every case and plotted the log of all these values, it would produce a normal distribution. So really what you have is a normally distributed variable that is the exponent of e here. And so the log normal variable is produced like this, that this z right here is a standard normal distribution. 
this is the standard deviation that we're multiplying it by, and then we're adding in a mean. And if we raise the base of the natural logarithm to this exponent, which is, is a random variable, we will produce a log normal distribution. This one happens to be the standard log normal distribution because this mu here is zero and the standard deviation is one, just like a standard score is. Now, as you recall, from the central limit theorem, we learned that normal distributions tend to be created when we add lots of variables together. In many circumstances, when you add a lot of variables together, you will get a normally distributed variable. Well, logs, you might know, are associated with multiplication. And what we've got here is when we have a lot of variables, all of which are positive, we can't have negative values, but if all of our variables are positive and we multiply them together, the product produces this log normal distribution. Now, where would we see the log normal distribution? Well, we see it in lots of different places. Here's one, income distribution. Here's the income distribution in 2005 in the United States. And here we have the bottom 90%, because if we had the top 2%, it would, it would go really off the scale. But what we have is something that's approximately not log normally distributed. Not perfectly, but, but approximately. So now, why would this happen? Well, I don't claim any particular expertise in what produces differences in income. But let's take a very, very simple model. Now, we could put in a whole bunch of other variables, and we would multiply them together. So what would this multiplication produce? So if you've got a lot of talent, and you're super diligent, and you're super lucky, you're going to have an income that's really, really high. If you're super talented and super diligent, but not particularly lucky, you're going to have a more moderate income. It'll probably be better than average, but it won't be you know, Bill Gates level. There are a lot of people just as talented as Bill Gates. There are a lot of people just as diligent, but they weren't as lucky as he was. Or there are a lot of people who are just as lucky as he was, just as diligent, but not as talented. So to produce a really extreme value, you need all of these variables to be high. And if not, you're going to get a more moderate value. This, of course, is not how income really works. It's an illustration of why income might be log normally distributed. Here's another process that will produce a skewed distribution. The z is, is normally distributed. It's a standard normal variable. It has a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. If we take each value of z and square it, the distribution will have what we call a chi-square distribution. You may have heard of a chi-square distribution if you've taken a statistics course. And uh, this is a chi-square distribution with a degree of freedom of 1. It turns out that it corresponds to the fact that we have one normally distributed variable that we are squaring. Now, what about when there are two degrees of freedom? Well, what happens is that we take two normally distributed variables, square them, and then add them. So adding together z1 and z2, the squared, uh, will get a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. And then three degrees of freedom, of course, we take three normally distributed variables and square them and then add them together, and then four and then 10 and so forth. Now, imagine what would happen, what, would, what the shape of the chi-square distribution would be if instead of degrees of freedom of 10, let's say 1,000, if we took 1,000 normally distributed variables, squared each of them, and then added them together, what would the sum look like? Yes, you guessed it, it would be approximately normal. Why? Because it doesn't matter what the original distribution of a squared variable is, like this, this is what it looks like, as long as we keep adding lots of them together, and the sum will be approximately normal. So as the degrees of freedom in chi-square distribution goes up, the more normal the sum looks like. There are many, many, many other distributions that are skewed. Here's one, the Weibull distribution. It's used to understand things like infant mortality and time for manufactured products to break down and so forth. So uh, here we have a, a distribution in which if it's going to break, it's going to break early or high infant mortality, and then you have fewer and fewer failures or, or deaths later on. Here's one that uh, has a more, it's a constant failure rate, and then here's one where most things don't break down at the beginning, but then there's a point in which they do, and then they start to break down. A Gumbel distribution is a family of distributions that has to do with the maximum value of a sample. So if we took lots of samples and sampled over and over and over again, and then we just picked the highest value each time, then uh, we can get something called the Gumbel distribution. The particulars of this doesn't really matter. But it's used to understand the, the, the things like you know, effects of floods, like the highest rainfall of the season will produce certain kinds of effects. So certain things in nature will have a Gumbel distribution. So the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution. That is, there's, in these dotted lines, there's, there's actually nothing. There's 
there's just uh, one at, at zero, at one, at two, at three, and four, and so forth. There's nothing in between. It models a situation in which a certain average number of events are going to occur in a particular time period, but it's random, and so sometimes you get less than that average, sometimes you get the average, sometimes you get more. Let's say we're waiting for customers at a store, and we get one customer an hour. Some hours we'll get zero customers, some will get one, some will get two, some will get three and four and five and six and seven. And so this is a model of how many customers we're likely to get in any particular hour, given that on average we're going to get one. If we have two customers per hour, like so, then you know some hours we'll get zero, but not as many. Some will get one, some will get two on average, and then three and four and five. And as you can guess, as, as this number gets higher and higher, it starts to look more and more like a normal distribution. So as we can see, there are a lot of different processes that can produce a skewed distribution. I've only shown just a few. So let's talk about expected values and moments and skewness. As we've seen before, the expected value of a variable is the mean. And the mean usually has this notation. I'm going to change the notation slightly so it's mu prime sub 1. And this is the unstandardized, uncentralized moment. It's a raw moment but it's still just the mean. If we take the value squared, the expected value here is mu prime sub two. It's the second raw moment, and the third raw moment, and the fourth raw moment, and the nth raw moment. It turns out that other than the first raw moment, they're not particularly useful. Sometimes the second raw moment's pretty cool, but we don't use them very much because they're hard to interpret. A more interpretable thing is a central moment, or a moment referred to the mean, sometimes called. So what we take is some variable x, and we subtract out the first raw moment. And so mu sub 1 is the first central moment. If we square the deviation from the mean, x minus its own mean, squared, the expected value of that is the second central moment, and the third central moment, and the fourth central moment, and the nth central moment. So it turns out that the first central moment is always, always, always 0. Why? because the expected value of mu is mu, and the expected value of x is mu, and so mu minus mu is always zero. So the first central moment isn't very useful, but as we'll see, the second central moment is rather useful. It's actually the variance. A standardized moment is when we take each central moment and we divide by the standard deviation. So x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation will produce the first central moment, which is 0, divided by the standard deviation. This is not particularly useful because, of course, it's going to be 0 every time. The second standardized moment will produce the second central moment divided by the variance. And the second central moment is the variance. And so we've got variance divided by variance. It equals 1. Not very useful either. But the third standardized moment is the third central moment divided by the standard deviation cubed. And this turns out to be skewness. This is our formula. There is such a thing as the fourth standardized moment. We'll see that, that the fourth standardized moment has a relationship with another statistic called kurtosis. This isn't kurtosis, but it has a relationship with it. And then we have the nth standardized moment, which beyond the fourth standardized moment, it becomes harder and harder to interpret it, what exactly it means. But we can create them if we like. The three in the upper right corner, we can just get rid of because they're not very useful. These ones we can get rid of too. And we can see that this one is the mean, and this one is the variance, and this one is skewness. So we start off with the mean, and then in the central moment, we're accounting for the mean, but we want variability after we've accounted for the mean. So we've got variance here. And then it, with skewness, we're uh, taking into account both the, the mean and the standard deviation, or the variance. And so it's a sort of a nice natural progression, like so, from mean to skewness. And we can see that mean and variance and skewness have a relationship. It has to do with expected values and different kinds of moments. The symbols that we use for the mean, the variance, and skewness look like this. There's a mu and a sigma squared and a gamma sub 1. So as we've seen, skewness has a relationship with a third central moment. It's actually the third standardized moment. But I want to show that skewness can be seen by splitting this formula up into its component parts. So right now, it's this formula for a z-score cubed. But if we factor one of them out, we get, we get the score minus the mean divided by its standard deviation. And then we get that same quantity squared. And you can think of 
this thing as its position, and this has to do with its variability. This will tell us how far it is from the mean, and this will tell us how variable something is. And when you multiply two things together, it's a good way, we'll see this later when we calculate the correlation coefficient, of discovering the relationship between two things. So embedded in the formula of skewness is that it's telling us what is the relationship between position and variability. When we're talking about something with positive skew, what we're saying is, as the position gets higher, we have more variability. More variability as we go up less variability as we go down. That is, compared to the normal curve, we have it, this amount of variability occurs less often down here compared to the normal curve, and this less often right in the middle, exactly the same. And then as we go up, the variability occurs more often in the blue distribution than in the black distribution, the normal distribution, like so. With negative skew, we get the opposite. That is, as the position goes up, the variability goes down. As the position goes down, the variability goes up. So what we're saying is that at the low end of the scale, more variability occurs more often in the blue distribution than in the normal distribution. And as we go up, this amount of variability occurs less often. Earlier we saw this strongly skewed unimodal distribution, and we can illustrate this point again, is that it's a mixture of a whole bunch of little normal distributions, but the ones that are low have very little variability. They're skinny here. And then as we go up the scale, these little mixtures are getting more and more variable. So less variability down here, more variability up here. And if we just mush them together into one big distribution, we get this highly skewed distribution. So what skewness is? Well, it's as the position goes up, you get more variability for a positively skewed distribution. In a negatively skewed distribution, it's a negative relationship with position and variability. That is, as we go up, we get less variability compared to low values. Next time, we'll talk about something called kurtosis, which has to do with how flat or how peaked the distribution is compared to the normal distribution.